Thirty-three, under State Secretary for Health, Mr. Uwe Moravich, 
founding chairman of the National Peace Foundation, Professor Donstein Wiesel, no Nobel Medicine in 1981 on the topic Science for Peace. We are thankful to Chairman U.V. Muravich and to Professor Donstein Wiesel for selecting the University of Health Science to host this memorable event. This university established in 1946 originally as the School for Medical Officer was abandoned and severely damaged during the Pol Pot time from 1979 to 1975 to 1979. The, U the university reopened its doors in 1980 with barely any resources. Since then, with support from France, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Germany, international organization and non governmental organization, as well as collaborating universities and institutions within and outside Cambodia, the university has supplied almost health workers to the health workforce in Cambodia, thus greatly contributing to the royal of the Royal Government of Cambodia, led by some like Aket Mahasena Patei Sen, in the restoration and improvement of the population health and well-being. Today, the, UN, the university is proud to be associated with the International Peace Foundation to organize a session of a series of bridge dialogues toward a culture of peace. We strongly believe that our distinguished guests and participants will actively interact with Professor Tonsten on how science can contribute to peace worldwide and especially in Cambodia. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Welcome to the third ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, which is a non-political and non-religious foundation under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna, Austria. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners including the country's major universities, and I would like to thank the University of Health Sciences Cambodia and its rector, Professor Om Sopal, for hosting our event today. Having started in November last year, Bridges is now being continuously held until April this year, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics as well as other eminent keynote speakers and artists such as Chen Long, the Hong Kong actor Chucky Chan, or Hollywood film director Oliver Stone, and also world-renowned pianist Vladimir Ashkenazi, who will perform at Chaktamuk Theater on the 9th of March. The third ASEAN series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence which was initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows the series of 350 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia since 2003. Bridges has been established as an international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary platform for creative cultures of learning and continued education for all people. The International Peace Foundation has no concept for peace and no fixed solution how to achieve peace. But we believe that the first step towards peace is dialogue and the first step towards dialogue is respect. The International Peace Foundation does not take sides but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where people meet who normally don't meet people from all walks of life, people who speak different languages, 
even if they speak the same. As politicians speak another language than artists, and scientists and religious leaders another one than people from business, it is seldom that they speak with each other or even work together. We live in a world where some people pretend to know the answers and solutions, how to solve problems, how to achieve peace, though the quest for peace lies in the art to post the right questions. The International Peace Foundation believes that the interconnected problems of today cannot be solved only by politicians, only by business, only by science, or by religion alone, but by working together. In the Bridges event series, people from all walks of life meet in a multidisciplinary program to find creative solutions to solve problems and to, to achieve peace. Peace within ourselves, peace within our families, within social structures, peace with nature and the environment, peace between nations, cultures, and religions. Peace is a process. Dialogue is a process. It is nothing which can be achieved instantly. It needs time. This is why Bridges is not organized as one single conference and then everything is over again and forgotten, but as a series of events over the period of six months in which Nobel laureates and other keynote speakers build bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. Peace is not something which can be left to the elite of a few, but which needs the participation of everyone. Only if many ways cross and people walking these ways meet, can international understanding be achieved and problems commonly solved. If we listen to and learn from each other, we may discover that there is not only one way to achieve peace, but that there are many ways and certainly ways we have never thought of to go. It is my pleasure to invite you today to listen to and share your views with Professor Thorsten Wiesel, a Nobel laureate for medicine who has agreed to come to Cambodia to help build bridges. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution towards peace. Som Okun. Welcome to the national and international guests. It is a great honor for us to welcome Prof. Thorsten Wiesel and Madame, and the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation to the University of Health Science, Cambodia. We are delighted to meet with one of the world's leading scientists and to hear and discuss an important subject in the series of public meetings designed to promote a culture of peace. In Cambodia, we have only recently started to enjoy the benefits of peace and stability after many years of war. I hope that your presence today will help us to continue to find peaceful way to develop our country. Cambodia is one of the world's least developed countries, and even though the recent economic crisis has shown that all countries in the world are connected economically. There is still a big gap between us and the developed world. We are separated by language, culture, and wealth, and in many other ways. So, a bridge between us and the developed world's great thinker can help us to exchange our knowledge and experiences. We are privileged today to have such a distinguished researcher as Professor Thorsten Wilson for his work on the neural basis of visual perception to share his knowledge and experience. His research shows how 
visual information collected by the retina is transmitted to and processed in the, the visual contact of the brain. His study opened the door for the understanding and treatment of a childhood cataract and strabismus. I hope he presents and the idea he is sharing with us today will inspire young Cambodians to do research in the future. On behalf of the Ministry of Health, I solemnly declare the public dialogue toward a culture of peace entitled Science for Peace is now officially open. I am looking forward to hearing Professor Thorsten Wiesel to share his knowledge and expression with all of us. Thank you. So, I first uh, like to thank you for inviting me to come here, and particularly Director Hong, uh, and for the nice welcome you have given me uh, this, this, this morning or this afternoon. And I also like to thank uh, the organizer of this event, uh, uh, Uwe Moritz, uh, for uh, this initiative of bringing uh, distinguished scientists to come uh, here to uh, communicate uh, their knowledge with you. Now, uh, I use this microphone because uh, I wanted to be sure that you could hear me because I tend to move around and uh, it's very important that you can hear me. So I wonder if you in the back could raise your hands if you can hear me. Nobody is raising his or her hands in the back. <laughs> okay, so you can hear me clearly. Now, 
you have uh, received this uh, booklet and uh, my speech will be very much uh, a sense speech that I'm going to give here and very, very, I'm very grateful that the university has printed because some of you may have difficult uh, with the language, particularly when I speak, I tend, my wife says that I tend to mumble. <laughs> so, if you, uh, you can follow in the text uh, as I give it, my lecture. Okay? And the, I just need to find my glasses. <laughs> and I look forward to, uh, I will give this lecture and then as you listen, and I'd like to, uh, that our dialogue uh, will be uh, a live, lively, uh, learn about attacks and the madness of suicide bombers, the collapse of the world economy, global warming, and statistics showing that, that over two billion people are living on less than two dollars a day. Now from my perspective, uh, having grown up in a large mental hospital where my father was a head psychiatrist, I feel right at home in this crazy world in which we all live. However, trained as a medical do doctor and a brain scientist, I, c I cannot, I must ask, what can we do to cure the illness of society? Or, a question, is it too late? So, I decided to make three points in this talk. And the first one, I try to address in a very simple-minded way uh, the issue about the peace of mind. And then I'd like to draw examples from scientists and who have received the Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, and therefore played a role as scientists for peace. And last, I will make a few comments about my own involvement, just to give you a reason to understand why I perhaps foolishly agreed to talk about science and peace, since I basically is a scientist. I spent 40 years in the laboratory, and is not really prepared to, eat, to uh, discuss great issues like science for peace. Now, it's difficult to talk about peace without talking about the war. Now, I grew up in Sweden during the 1930s and witnessed the event that led to the Second World War and observed as a young boy. I was, I was born in 1924 and the Second World War began in 1939 when I was 15 years old, but I was very interested early on in what happened in the world. And I noticed the tension between leaders that led up to the war. Now, of particular importance was when I, as a student, listened to Adolf Hitler on the radio, whipping up an entire audience at huge rallies through his skill as a demagogue and orator, and thereby creating mass hysteria with the audience screaming, Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! I still remember listening in the radio to, to these uh, kind of speech, speeches and the audience response. Now, this phenomenon of how you can influence 
large audiences. It's quite interesting from, from a brain scientist's point of view, observing how fragile the mind is in that powerful, the powerful orator of simple and destructive ideas can easily seduce individual minds and an entire population. We still do not understand, either as people or as scientists, how this occurs and how to protect the individual and the people from being afflicted by this kind of as I look at it, uh, an illness. We used uh, crossbreeding in order to generate the uh, plants that were resistant uh, to various uh, to dry climate, to insects, to various parasites and and uh, and selected them those. Uh, now I had um, the pleasure to meet the Bora at a meeting in China a few years ago, uh, a few years before he died, uh, a couple of three years ago. Uh, and he was a most charming and modest gentleman. And I asked him about uh, what he felt about having used a different approach of crossbreed, what he thought about genetic manipulations. Because, uh, and, and uh, so he said, oh, of course, this is a logical extension of the work I did, and I welcome it. I raise this point because, uh, as you know, there is a controversy in some countries, and perhaps even here in Cambodia, about the use of genetically modified food, so-called so GM food. Uh, and um, from I'm not a, a culturist, I'm a neuroscientist, but so far as my studies and what I know from talking to people in the field is that there's no real scientific uh, reason for the, the uh, uh, not using genetically, 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 genetically modified food. So policies in some countries against the use of gen genetically modified food seems not to be in the best interest for the farmers in terms of yield per acre, and most importantly, such regulation deprive needy and starving people of food. This, in te this new technology is truly a great example of how science, when applied constructively and intelligently, can serve to benefit mankind, and therefore, as I said before, also serve for using in science for peace. Now, in the last part of my talk, I will say a few words about my own reason for standing here and talking to you, in a sense. And, um, you know, as I said before, I've spent four years in the lab and really have been, when talking to a medical audience like this, it would be more natural for me to talk about my scientific work, work than science for peace. But I'm here to talk about science for peace and I'm very much, uh, as you can see from my last comment here in the presentation, I'm very much uh, involved in the effort to use science as one of the instruments for peace. Now, I just like to mention briefly that my last name is Wiesel, and there is an, a Nobel Peace Prize winner called Amy Wiesel. And he won his uh, Peace Prize in 1984, I think it was, um, 85 actually. And, uh, for his beautiful books, he's, he's a very good writer. He didn't win the literary prize, but he won the peace prize because he, he through his book, uh, made the point about the, what happened in the Holocaust, and and uh, that uh, sort of 
since that was one of the great tragedies in modern history, uh, this kind of genocide. Um, and he, he sort of, through his writing uh, and passion, became sort of a, a logical winner of the Peace Prize. Now, uh, we have the same name, but I received my Peace, my peace Prize, my pre Prize in, in Science, uh, as we heard earlier, in 1981. And uh, the only thing we have in common really is our name, our last name, Wiesel. Uh, now, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not Jewish, he is Jewish, and it's written about the Holocaust, but I'm Swedish, so we have no re relationship directly. Except that uh, Elie Wiesel um, has had a foundation uh, which, together with the King of Jordan, organized what's called the Petra Conferences for Northern Orient held in Petra uh, every, every year, I held it five times. And uh, uh, we met annually uh, to discuss uh, both the Nobel laureates and the Peace laureates. Um, and it was established this uh, meeting to combat intolerance, indifference, and injustice through international dialogue and the use focused programs and youth focused programs. And it's this kind of work to, to, uh, that we have sort of is a theme of my presentation here. And uh, I'd like to quote here a, a physicist, uh, a very well known physicist. He's British and original, but he had been uh, living in America many years at, in Princeton. And uh, he has written many books. and. And he has some point of views which I don't agree with about the environment, but he is, uh, in this case, he wrote a book. A student, and uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Mr. Professor, and I have here two questions. Us. First, I wonder what can we do as each of us, what can we do to contribute to peace? And my second question is that, uh, it's just an opinion, there's a question about peace and war. Because some people claim that we need to make war in order to gain peace. And what about your idea? Thank you. Genetically modified foods. And so far, you still heard from the media. In some country, they have the legislation that any food that is from genetically modified product they need to mention. Even some animal that is raised by this genetically modified food, they need to mention also. So, I think, uh, and so far, we don't have any information. So, we still had some doubt about that. So. As you are a researcher and scientist, I want to know, it's since the beginning of the creation of the genetically modified food, does we have enough evidence to say the, about the safety of this food, that for the long-standing disease, like cancer, for example, or other health problems? Now, you are asking a uh, very headlines, but our headlines, Medical. Just one question, speed question, I think. Uh, do you have any advice for a researcher or a scientist to a memoir report event? And I would like to say thank you to Professor Torsten, who is conducting this even today. And uh, my question is, uh, I'm still doubtful about peace. Uh, as we know that peace can occur everywhere, peace can occur in community, in family, in society, in country. But uh, I believe that peace, uh, all of this peace comes from peace in our mind, 
But the most important thing that I would like to say is mind is always changeable. So how can we keep our mind peaceful and stably? This is my question. Thank you. I think one of uh, my messages for the human as an individual for peace. I mean, we have to think about peace, not only peace and war, peace. That for a while, this comes with the peace of mind. And I, I think that the uh, local conflicts, as I said, in families or associations or work, This is where you as a member of society uh, can play a very important role. And the main thing is obviously you have an important role today. And uh, the, the, uh, I think the values in, in the society, the values of, of respect for every individual, and that is what we do, that means it's a society and that means so it really is our hope that these Nobel laureates normally, I mean their time is very precious. Normally when they visit a country, what they see of the country are airports and hotels. So maybe they, live, they give a lecture, on the next day they leave. Professor Wiesel is here in this country for two weeks. We have invited these Nobel laureates, not here to come to speak, but to listen. So, because dialogue starts with listening, not only with speaking. So what we hope... Next, I would like to invite Professor Ong Sopal to present a book and to...